said several times this morning, this is Father's Day, and, and we're honoring all of our fathers in our congregation today, and we're also uh, honoring those who are listening and watching us through some kind of a media. We want to say again, thank you for being good fathers. You notice that I didn't say perfect fathers because there's only one perfect father, and his name is our God, Father God. He's the only perfect one. We're not perfect, but... Uh, we, uh, we know someone that is, and it's God our Father. The, um, 60 years ago, last month, I graduated from the St. Louis College of Pharmacy. I think I was, I don't know, I think I was eight or nine years old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, pharmacy was a lot different in those days. And uh, one of the things that I remember uh, the most about it was that we didn't... Uh, uh, we didn't have all of the uh, commercial packaging of medicine that we have today, and so quite often we had to, we had to make we had to make something we had to compound something in order to be able to get all of it put together uh, like the doctor wanted it, and we had to we had to follow a formula to do that, and uh, we called it a prescription or a recipe, whatever you want to call it. But we would mix all of these ingredients in a particular way. Some of them had to be made in a special way, and I, uh, I don't want to bore you, but uh, there was something that, we, uh, that uh, the doc doctors, uh, dermatologists used quite a bit for acne, and it was called white lotion. And so uh, it was two products, and uh, one of them was sulfurated potash, and for the life of me, I can't think of what the other one was because it's been a long while. But uh, anyhow, the other one was clear, and sulfurated potash was yellow. And if you poured it in the wrong way, well, it wouldn't turn white. It would stay yellow. And so you had to know how to do that. And believe me, you at one time I did know how to do that, but it's been a long, long time. And so uh, what I'm saying is this, that these things had to put, be put together in the proper way in order to have a good finished uh, product. And while I was uh, thinking about a sermon for today, I was thinking about the fact that, um, that the Lord has the perfect formula for fathers. He's got the perfect formula for fathers. His recipe book is, is right here. This is his recipe book. And the formula to be a good father is in that book. And it contains all the necessary ingredients and all of the instructions for using the right amount of each one of those things that are contained here at the right time and blending them together in the proper way to make a good father a first-rate father. And if we will but take his, take his book and read his book and apply his book to our lives, we will be good fathers. We really have no excuse for not being a good father because the Lord has given us all of the tools that we need and they're contained right here in this book. By the way, uh, this recipe book is not only for fathers. The ingredients and the instructions that are there are for all of us. And if we will read and if we will study and if we will apply what's in this book, then every one of us can be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ and we can live a godly life if we will but follow what he has put in this book. You don't have to be a genius to understand that we're living in perilous times. The Bible says that. It says that perilous times will come. And that's where we're living today. There is an attack on the traditional family like never ever before in all of history. The traditional family is under attack day in and day out. The traditional family as described in the Bible 
is a man and a woman who are married, who have one or more children, who are either their biological children or adopted children. And that's what the Bible describes as a traditional family. That model that's described in the Bible of a traditional family is in rapid decline in our country, and it's in danger of being annihilated. Think about that just for a moment. Think about the family, the family unit today as compared to the family unit even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There is no comparison today to the family unit as when I was growing up. No comparison. It is entirely, entirely different. When it comes to the family, the secular worldly system tells us that abnormal is now the new normal. Abnormal is the new normal. The devil knows this. If he can get to the head of the family, the father, he can destroy the family. And not only can he destroy the family, he will inflict severe damage on the church. If he can get to one man, the father, if he can get to him, he will destroy the family. And he will severely, severely damage the church. The battle for the family is raging like a wildfire. But it's not going to be won in the courts. And it's not going to be won at the ballot box. It's going to be won in the spirit. Because it's a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual battle. The likes that we have never, ever seen in our lifetime. We're in a battle. And the Bible says that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where the battle is. And we will only win that battle when we choose. It's a choice. When we choose to stand and pray and reach out to the kingdom of God and put a stop to what the enemy is doing. We can do it in prayer, in prayer. It's good to vote. It's good to do those things. It's good to have good people in our courts who are making good decisions, but it's a spiritual battle. And it'll only be, it'll only be won when we're willing to stand and pray and do spiritual battle with the enemy. And it's not, it's not just on occasion. It's a daily battle. We've got to do it every day. We can't wait till Sunday morning for sure. And we can't just say, well, hey, you know, I had a pretty good day today. I guess I don't need to pray today. I guess I don't need to stand against this today. No, 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 no. We need to do it every day. Every day we need to do that. Today's sermon is sort of directed toward fathers. I don't beat up on fathers on Father's Day. Uh, you didn't come here to get beat up on. I'm going to encourage you today. But I think there's some things also in my sermon today that will probably minister to all of us in some way. And the title of my sermon, as you can see on the screen, is The Perfect Formula for Fathers. I'm going to read it out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. And it's printed in your bulletin, and it's going to be on the screen. But um, when I, uh, it seemed like the Lord led me to that text, and I thought, that, that doesn't even apply. And uh, as I begin to read the thing over and over, I've told you many times that I'll usually read the text in eight or ten different translations. And I began to read it over and over and over. I thought, my goodness, this is a Father's Day sermon. And I had never, ever seen it as that before. But uh, you're going to see when we, when we read it, you're going to see too, I think, that it's a Father's Day sermon. And this is the Apostle Paul talking. And he says, on the contrary, we speak of men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. And they said, we're not trying to please men, but we're trying to please God. Let me tell you what the, what the root of false doctrine is. 
The root of false doctrine is trying to please men rather than God. If we get off, if we get off on trying to please men, we'll mess up every time. And we'll get off into error if we try to please men. Paul says, hey, we're not trying to please men. We're trying to please God. And God checks us out. He says, God tests our hearts. He says, you know, we were never flattering, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. He said, we're not looking for praise from men and not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. In other words, Paul's telling this. He said, you know, we came there and we worked our way through. We didn't come there and sit at your table every day and expect you to pamper us. He said, we didn't do that. Although we could have because the Bible says, you know, that, that, the, that the worker is, is worthy of his pay. Paul said, we didn't do that. We came there because we wanted you to know that the gospel is free. And we came and, and we did all these things. Then he says in verse 7, and we were gentle among you. This is Paul. I mean, Paul was a rough dude. And he said, we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. And he says, and we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but, but our very lives. You know, I can just imagine that, uh, that Paul, when he went somewhere, if maybe the head of the house was painting his house, I'm guessing Paul picked up a paintbrush. I can remember one year when we were downtown and we were, we were fixing a room up in that, in that building downtown and uh, we, were, we, were, uh, we, were gonna, we, sheet, we had sheetrock on the walls and Dirk Wood came and he was in the Philippines then and he said, hey, he said, I got a little extra time. You can just see Dirk doing that, you know, jerking around, you know, and he said, I got a little extra time. Is there anything you want me to do? And I said, well, you were a painter, weren't you? And I knew he was. <laughs> he said, yeah. And I said, well, did you ever put on any, any mud? Did you ever do any taping? Yeah. And I said, well, let's go downtown. And we went downtown, and he taped that whole room and painted it. It would have taken us a week. I believe Paul did that. Paul was a tent maker. But I believe when Paul went anywhere, it says here, he says, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well. Because you had become so dear to us. He loved these people so much that Paul connected with them. He connected with them, not just with the gospel, but he connected with them in every way. And he says, surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God. But how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Now, it's, I said all that to say this. We're getting to the Father's Day part now, okay? Verse 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. That's how Paul dealt with these people. And he says, hey, here's an example. And then he says this in verse 12. We encouraged you, we comforted you, and we urged you on to live a life worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. That's the Father's Day sermon. He said, we dealt with you as a father deals with his own children. We don't know. I don't think Paul had children. Some people think Paul was married. He may have been. But we, we don't know that he had any children. But you see, uh, he, knew, he knew how to deal with people. And he knew how to deal with people because of the power of the Holy Spirit that lived inside of him. The first ingredient in the formula to becoming a good father is to be a born-again to be a born-again believer. Jesus said this, and it's a command, by the way, when he was talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, uh, who was a religious man, came to see him one night, and uh, Paul said this. He says, you must be born again. It's a command. He didn't give him an option. He said, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And, of course, Nicodemus asked him, well, you know, how can a man be born again? And Jesus told him. But he says, there isn't any other way to salvation. You see, we know today there's only one way. Jesus said, I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life and no man comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way. And you must be born again. He is the only way. And if you haven't done that, well then, 
You're not obeying God. Because he said, you must be born again. It's a command. If you want to see the kingdom of God, if you want to spend eternity in heaven, you must be born again. And the Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be born again. We will be born again. The Bible says that very clearly. And what does it mean is this? It means this, that when we are born again, we are going to reject the lifestyle of the kingdom of darkness. The Bible says that we have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We've been called out of that darkness. When were we called out? When did we come out? When we were born again. We're no longer in darkness. We're in the light now. It also means that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. When we were born again, the Holy Spirit in me and in you was was made alive. It was regenerated. We had a spirit in it, but the spirit was not alive. When we were born again, the Holy Spirit became alive in us. The Bible says that we are a, we are a tripartite, just like God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We are a spirit. The real me and the real you is a spirit. I possess a soul. My soul is my mind and my will and my emotions, and I live in a body. This is my tent. This is my tent. One of these days they're going to bury this tent. I hope it'll be another long while. But if if it's today, I'm ready. Why? Because I'm born again. But this is my tent. And one of these days they will bury this. And when they do, my spirit and my soul will step over immediately into the presence of God. And then the Bible says one of these days, one of these days he's going to come again. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And they're going to meet him. They're going to meet him in the air. And their spirit and their soul is going to be reunited with their body. And those of us who are still living are going to be caught up with him. I hope it's today, don't you? (laughs) I'm quitting right there and going home. I hope it's today. And here's, here's the best part. It says, we will be with him forever. We will be with him forever. So all of those things happened when we were born again. When we were born again into the kingdom of God. It means also that we are now in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. We're in covenant with him. We're in covenant with him. And there there are things that he said that he would do for us simply because we are in covenant with him. Wow. The Bible says that in him we live and move and have our being. Amen. It's in him. We are in covenant with him. And we are partakers of his promises because we're in covenant with him. He says, I'll provide for you. He said, I'll be your peace. I'll be all these things to you. Why? Because we are in covenant with him and we are, we are recipients of his good promises. Wow. God is just awesome, isn't it? There's no way, there's no way that you or I can be a good father. No way unless we are born again. There's no way that we can be a good father unless we are born again. Unless Jesus lives in us, there is no way, and I can give you a scripture. The Bible says in John, it says that you can do nothing without him. I don't know how. I couldn't be a good father, and you couldn't be a good father. You can't be a good follower of Jesus Christ if you don't have him in here. You can't be anything in the kingdom of God unless he's in here, unless he's guiding you, unless he's directing your life. It says that. Now, we can do some good stuff. We can do some good stuff. I know a lot of heathens that are doing some good things. Can somebody give me an amen? We all do, don't we? We can do that. We can do that. But we can't do anything on our own that God will accept and honor as good. 
He says, you can't do it. Then he comes along and says this, but you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I can't do anything on my own to be a good father, but with him, with him, I can do everything to be a good father. Being a good father has nothing to do with our level of education. It has nothing to do with our size of our bank account. It has nothing to do with our importance in the community. Being a good father has everything to do with knowing God the Father. Listen to what God said. He said this through his prophet Jeremiah. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the strong man boast of his strength. And let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this that he understands and knows me. Wow. That's a word for all of us. Being a good mother, a good son, a good daughter, a good person, I think that covers everybody, is predicated on knowing Jesus Christ. And when we know him, Jesus, Jesus told the apostles, this, hey, when you know me, you know the Father. When you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And when we know him, we know the Father. The apostle Paul said that he considered everything worthless as compared to knowing Jesus Christ. There is nothing in all of creation that is even com comparable to knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The next ingredient to the formula to being a good father is to please God. It's to please God. Our text tells us this. Fathers are not trying to please men. They're trying to please God. When our sons and our daughters see us, when they see their father living a life that pleases God, they too will want to live that kind of life. I was extremely blessed. My father, my father served the Lord. And when I saw my father serving God, I said many, many times, and my wife will give credence to this, I want to be like my dad. I want to be like him because he served God. And I'm here to tell you that when we do that, when we do that, our children will also want to serve God. I don't know if you've ever heard of this man, but there's a man by the name of Charles Kettering, and uh, he was an engineer. He was a, a businessman. He was a, uh, an inventor. As a matter of fact, he invented, he invented the electric starter for automobiles. He invented a lot of different things. He had 189 patents. He invented a lot of things for automobiles. And maybe you've heard of the, uh, the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, well, he's the, he's the Kettering in that particular place. He gave a lot of money there, and they established this cancer center. Let me tell you what he said. He was a pretty wise man. And he said, every father should remember that one day his son will follow his example, not his advice. Think about him. Just think about that. How many fathers, I'm guilty, give a lot of advice? I have given a lot of advice, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, Percy Pavlov, the pastor at Christian Fellowship, he, all, he always said this, unasked for advice is criticism, and I think he's probably right. I think he's probably right, but I've given a lot of advice, but when I saw that, I thought, man, oh man, they're going to follow my example. They probably don't remember any of the advice that I gave them, but they know the example and they're going to follow the example. The Bible gives us a lot of ways to please God. That's what Paul said. He said, we're not trying to please men. We're trying to please God. And the Bible gives us a lot of ways that we can please God. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we don't have faith, we're not going to please God. He said, how do we get faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But it says without faith, it is impossible to please God. When we obey God, it pleases Him. When, when, God, when God shows us something in His Word, or when, when God tells us, when He speaks to our spirit, and we obey Him, it pleases Him when we do that. 
It pleases him when we do his will. What is his will? It's his word. When we do his will, it pleases God. But I think probably the thing maybe that pleases God the most is when we walk in the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? It just means walking in the ways of the Lord. The ways of the Lord are described in his word. And when we walk in the Spirit, we are walking in the ways of the Lord. Children need to see their father walking with God, not just on Sunday morning, but every day of the week. The Bible says this in Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How many know that our flesh is powerful? Our flesh is powerful, and we're in a constant battle to control our flesh. My flesh tells me that when they bring a cherry pie, eat all of it. <laughs> and I usually do. I have a difficult time controlling my flesh and the lust of the flesh, and we all do. It's difficult. When we're walking in the Holy Spirit, what are we doing? We're depending on God. And we're depending on His Holy Spirit to help us and to direct our lives. And to help us to help us to overcome the flesh. When we're walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh, we will have power to give the most important thing that our children need we can give that when we're walking in the Spirit, and our children need unconditional love. We can't do that if we're not walking in the Spirit. They need to, they need to see that we love them unconditionally. We don't always love what they do, but we love them unconditionally. The Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Everything that we do as a loving father toward our children flows out of our love for God. It flows out of our love for God. If we're, not in, if we're out of fellowship with God, we'll be out of fellowship with our children We'll be out of fellowship with our spouse, and we'll be out of fellowship with everyone else. Here's our problem. We don't take responsibility for our own actions, and we're always looking for an excuse or someone else to blame for our problems. Listen, we can't fix, we can't fix our problems with our children. We can't fix our problem with our spouse. And we can't fix our problems with anyone else until we fix our problem with God. That's where our problem is. Our problem is not with our children. Our problem is not with our spouse. And it's not with other people. Our problem is with God. When we get it right with God, we'll get it right with everyone else. When the vertical, when the vertical is right with God, the horizontal will be right with all people. We have to get it right with God. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, there's maybe a lot of different ways, but I think probably the most important way is this, and none of us want to do this. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You see, sometimes as fathers, we have to humble ourselves to our children. We have to admit to our children that we have made a mistake.
And when we do that, it's amazing. It's amazing how quickly the tide will turn and that our hearts will get together again. And all it took was this little thing of humbling ourselves before our children. I have found that it works with my spouse. I don't like to humble myself before my spouse. I thought she said amen. Did she say amen? I don't like to do that. I'm always right. Am I talking to the right men? I don't like that. But I do find this. It works if we will humble ourselves. And it works the other way also. You see, she thinks she's always right. So what do we have to do? We have, I, I see a lot of guys going like this. <laughs> and a lot of women going like this. I'm going to get everybody. It says, what do we do? He says, it says, he will lift us up. It doesn't say they will. He said, listen, when you do that, I'm going to come on the scene and I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to do it. How simple. And we, we suffer and, and, and we, we go through all kinds of garbage simply because we are not willing to humble ourselves. Well, last point. The formula to, be, uh, to being a good father shows us how to deal with our children. And we read in the text, we deal with our children by encouraging them, comforting them, and urging them on. I'm just going to say a couple of things about comforting, and then I'm going to just say a couple of things about urging them on, but I want to say a number of things about encouraging them. It says we're to comfort our children. That means we're to bind up their wounds when they hurt. And I'm not talking about only physical wounds. The mothers are usually good at binding the physical wounds. We need to bind up their wounds when they hurt. I'm telling you today, children are hurting today. And they need a father and a mother that they can come to and that they can share their heart with and that they can be healed, that their wounds can be not just covered, but that their wounds can be healed. Listen, if we're too busy to listen to our children, they will find someone else who will listen. And it may be the wrong person. So we need to take time. When we comfort them, we need to take time to listen to them. And then he says that we're to urge them to walk with the Lord. That simply means living in a way that, that shows them that it works. It works walking with the Lord. This is not a waste of time. This is not some, some fantasy thing that we're on, this walk with the Lord. It works. It works in every way. Back to encouraging. One of the ways, major ways, I believe, that a father deals with his children is by encouraging his children. Encouraging them goes hand in hand with loving them. If you love your children, and we all do, we will encourage them. Everyone, and especially children, have a deep-seated need to be encouraged. Everybody needs encouragement. I've never met anybody who doesn't need encouragement. The Bible says that encourage one another and build one another up. If we don't encourage and build up our children, they will not know if they're on the right path or if they're on the wrong path. They won't have any way of knowing if they're doing things right if we don't encourage them. Encourage, encouraging them will give them the freedom to make mistakes. We need to give our children the freedom to make mistakes. I've never ever heard anybody say this. Back off. I'm getting way too much encouragement. <laughs> I've never heard anybody say that. I've never. We all need encouragement. You see, if, if we're not 
encouraged. We don't, we don't know. We don't know if we're doing it right or if we're doing it wrong. My wife, I'm using my wife a lot today because she moved over here and I thought, well, if you're going to move over there, I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> my wife's an awesome cook. You can tell that. But when she makes something that, that is just outstanding, I always encourage her. I say, man, oh man, that's, you know, you've made, you've made that a lot, but I think that today's the best time. It's, it's, it's the best. I encourage her. I encourage her because I'm no dummy. <laughs> I'll be having that more often and more of it. Everybody needs to be encouraged. And our children need, they need encouragement. Let me just, let me just, this is, this is me, okay? Our children are hearing all kinds of discouraging words everywhere. And as fathers, we need to set our mind and we need to set our mouth that when we get up every day that we are going to encourage our children every time we get an opportunity. Because they're going to be hearing all kinds of discouraging things when they get out into the world. I think that we probably, we probably need to make it our house one of those things like home on the range. Where never is heard a discouraging word. Our children need to be. Are they going to make mistakes? Absolutely. Do they need discipline? Absolutely. But the thing they need more than anything is encouragement. They need to be encouraged. We need to tell our children. You got it. I see that a lot on Facebook today. People will answer, answer somebody and say, you got it. I'm not quite sure what that meant sometimes. I finally figured it out. It means, hey, you know what you're doing. We need to encourage our children. We need to tell them, hey, you got it. We need to tell them once in a while that we trust them. Hey, I trust you. I trust you. And I want to trust you until you prove me wrong. And if you prove me wrong, I'm going to love you and encourage you, and I'm going to give you another chance. We need, to, we need to start seeing the glass half full instead of half empty. We need to start seeing the good in our children rather than the bad. And we need to be a cheerleader for our children. I see dads that get excited about all kinds of things and cheer. We need to get excited about our children and cheer them on and cheer them on. I was thinking about my sermon and I thought, I haven't told, I haven't, I haven't told you anything new this morning. The perfect formula for fathers is right here. And many of you know this. But once in a while, we need a reminder. We need a reminder that, Lord, I need you so much. I need the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in my life because I can't do anything the way you want it done without you. I need you so much. And if I will just turn loose and let you, I can do everything all things through Christ. And one of these days, one of these days, my children, they'll do what the Bible says in Proverbs 31 to their mother. They will stand up and they will say, I didn't follow your advice. I followed your life. Let's all stand. Father, we thank you for those good words that Paul wrote some 2,000 years ago, that he wasn't trying to please men, but he was trying to please you. And Lord, more than anything, we want to please you. We want to be father pleasers. We want to please you in everything that we do, everything that we say, and everything that we thank. Father, we thank you 
today that you have that you have given us your mighty Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, that we are walking in your spirit and we are not walking in the flesh. We know, God, by your spirit, we can do all things. We can even be good fathers. And so today, Lord, that's our plea. Help us, Lord, to be the very best father that we can be. And help us, Lord, when the time comes that we need to humble ourselves and let you lift us up, that we would be willing to do that in the name of your Son, Jesus. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Happy Father's Day. See you next week. Yeah, you hold my-